I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hey everybody, it's Ken Davenport. I wanted to make sure you heard the news that I'm bringing the Deaf West production of Spring Awakening to Broadway in the fall. If you love Spring Awakening, you wait until you see this production because you've never seen anything like it. Deaf West is one of the most innovative theater companies I've ever worked with and ever seen. Uh, and their production of Spring Awakening is mind-blowing. Check it out. Go to Ticketmaster.com. Get tickets. We start performances on September 7th. Oof, I got a lot of work to do. Okay, on with the podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Ken Davenport. You're listening to the Producer's Perspective podcast. We've got a very, very special guest this week on the podcast. You may not know his name, but you may have met him, especially if you're a Kinky Boots fan. Uh, I want you to introduce you all to John Barker, one of the ushers at the Hirschfeld Theater. Welcome, John. Hey there. So let me give you a little backstory about why I invited John here. Uh, My first show that I produced was the Awesome 80s Prom. Now, before I produced it, I had worked uh, as a company manager and general manager for a ton of big-time Broadway shows, Thoroughly Modern Millie and Gypsy and a whole bunch. And when you work on a big Broadway show, you have all of this infrastructure and these people between you and the customers. Uh, But when I went to work on the prom, I was the general manager. I was the group sales agent. I actually directed that. And yes, I actually escorted people to their seats. Uh, And even though I had worked on Broadway shows for about a decade before that, I swear to you, I never learned more than when I was working on the prom. And that was because for the first time in my career, I was on the front lines. I was actually talking to the consumer. I was hearing what their problems were, what their issues were, what it took them to get to purchase tickets. And I learned so much and really defined who I am today as a producer. Uh, And ushers are so important to the Broadway community because they are on the front lines every single night. Uh, And John is here because he's one of the Jujamison Theater chain's pride and joy He came very highly recommended as one of their favorite ushers, Uh, so he graciously agreed to be on the podcast. So, John, tell me, how did this all start? How did you get the gig as an usher? That is actually a great question. It is about who you know uh, sometimes, and uh, I had been working in the uh, Houston theater scene, Alley Theater, Theater Under the Stars. I had done different things with them, but I did do some front of house work, so it was a very logical connection to Jujamson through a sibling, someone who used to be a manager at Jujamson, his sister recommended me, bam, it helped me get right in. And basically this job was my first job in New York City. Uh, my first show to Usher was Man of La Mancha, The Revival, which was incredible. I, I, and I spent the whole first year being amazed by the fact that I was being paid to sit here and watch The Revival of Nine and Man of La Mancha and all these great shows. Um, to be paid to do this was was incredible because you know back in the regional scene it could be a lot of volunteer work for people but on Broadway it's a paid union job and uh, it's been my survival job off and on these past twelve years. So you've been doing it for twelve years. Now. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I well I, I also spent a little bit of time in there doing. Uh, I was a backstage doorman at the Walter Kerr Theater, so that was a little bit of a a middle part of uh, my time with them was doing that steady for a little while. Um, and now I'm back to ushering um, and also subbing in on the door at Kinky Boots. Have you always worked for Drew Jamson in the same theater chain? That's right, yeah. I've done a couple of shows with a couple of, uh, with, with one of the other chains. I won't name their name, though. I might mention them later. <laughs> but uh, Drew Jamson has been my home all this time. And yeah, a lot of people may not know this, but ushering is a union gig here on mm-hmm. Broadway. And also the same union reps the people that work at the stage door. That's correct. And funny enough movie theater projectionists. Not sure how that all fits together, but that is the way it's broken down. Of course, it makes perfect sense. (laughs) Only New York unions. Uh, Okay, so when you started the job as an usher, was there a training period? How did it work? Were you just tossed out there and say, hey, show people to your seats? Well, okay, so that's a nice uh, contrast to how things maybe are now and how things were back then. I kind of was thrown into it back then a little bit. I, but I think they also maybe trusted that I knew what I was doing based on my prior experience. I mean, we, I did have an interview with them, so maybe they sensed that I knew enough to jump right in. But uh, there wasn't as much training back then. Now there is. And now there's a lot of care taken into making sure that a new usher knows what to do, is walked through the theater, 
and all of those things. And it's part of any time you start, you go to do a new show, if you're subbing at another theater or, or what have you, is find out all the specifics about that show and that theater and what's going on. Is anything to do with restrooms, where they're located, to how long is the show, what are the late seating cues? And so a big part of our job every day is helping those new people know what's up because it can be a little uh, crazy just jumping in. And everyone forgets, I think, sometimes that, that these new sub-ushers need, need that help. Do you wear uniforms at the jam? We they, do. Yeah. Did you wear uniforms when you started? Yes. They were less, uh, they were less uh, uniformy. They were just black pants and a white dress shirt. Uh, they didn't even have a set tie back then. I think we just had to wear a dark tie. And then it went into a phase where we had the Jujamson logo on the tie. It was a nice bright red tie. And then just recently they, they modified it to this really nice look where we have these nice blazers with the Jujamson logo and we wear black dress shirts now and black ties. And everyone looks a lot classier. Everyone's a little bit sexier now, um, ushering on Broadway because of this new look. Jujamson is run by Jordan Roth. He's a sexy oh, guy. Absolutely. So of course, his usher <laughs> looks sexy. I love it. Uh, and do you like this change that's happened over the last 12 years? You know what? That is uh, definitely something I've, I've come to really respect about what they've done with, with the company. Because I don't, I, I may be incorrect about this, but my impression has been that Jujamson was the first of the, at least of the for-profit houses, to revolutionize this customer service. Um, and, I, and I know that there is at least one other chain that's not doing that. And so when I went back and usher with them recently, I noticed that that working with them felt like the way it used to be. You know, it used to be that you could come into the theater and expect the usher might be grouchy. It might be really grumpy with you. That was sort of the way it was back then. And uh, when Jordan became president, he slowly, which is a good thing because you can't do change too fast, he slowly started implementing all of these new ideas. And I think most of the ushers have been pretty okay with it. I think sometimes you know, people get grumbly about change, but... The changes have been really for the better because I always found that when you came to work and were in a good mood and, and were nice to the patrons, your day was easier, your job was easier. And now that's sort of the culture of where I work. And so it's a lot easier to work with other ushers and with the patrons and with anyone else who's working in the theater when we all have this understanding that we're going to be treating each other with, it sounds so silly to say it, but treating each other with respect and giving good customer service. Um, and that's something that, that has built over the years. You know, little, little things from, uh, we have these trains where we learn and talk about the challenges of being an usher. And well, how do we address those challenges? What are our options? Could, should we be mean to the patron? Should we maybe be understanding and, and, and help them? Uh, and that's been a process that, uh, like I said, it's just it's made it a much happier place to work. And what do you like about being an usher? Like what about it really appeals to you and why do you keep doing it? It's been 12 years, yeah. a dozen well, years Well, now. personally, being completely selfish in the answer, it's because it's been one of the most flexible uh, and, and beneficial survival jobs and that it pays decently for what scheduling it is. And uh, you're, you're around the scene, you're around the Broadway scene, so you're, you're getting to meet people and uh, feel connected. And, and, and one of the favorite things I like about being around a show for a long time is watching the actors work over a period of time. Whether it's watching Billy Porter for, for the last couple of years continue to grow and, and make that role even more special than he already had when he won the Tony. And then it's also fun watching the understudies go in and replacement actors go in. And you can learn a lot from just observing that process. Um, so I, fi I find the educational in it. Um, I do enjoy uh, the people I work with. So that's allowed me to to be happy in the job and I know that at the end of the day of all the jobs I could have especially in this city this is probably the the least worthy of complaint I know mean, you can complain about any job but this job every time I complain about my job I, I have to slap myself and say but really you could be standing behind a counter somewhere serving coffee or waiting tables and you're not so but that's a great tip for anyone out there that's looking to get into the business. Just being around it and being able to observe it, you can learn a lot no matter where you are, whether you're ushering, whether you're at the stage door. If you could define what the responsibility of an usher was, like what, what do you think the responsibility is? Like what, what would define an usher for you? An usher is 
I mean, obviously responsible for getting the patrons to the right seat and giving them their playbill. That's sort of a basic for every, you know, patron. It's being there to answer questions. You know, patrons have needs. They have, they don't know where things are. You do. So you have to be able to tell them the bathroom is over here. The coat check is over there. You can use the bar down here or upstairs. I mean, whatever it could possibly be. I mean, I, tr I think, and I think that this is what Juju Amson has tried to help us feel is this sense of taking care of the patients while they're there, to be a host, to, to welcome them into our home and make them have a good time as if, you know, they're at the party and you're trying to take care of them. That's the ideal. And so I do feel a little bit of that when I'm with these people. I feel like they're my, my, my guests sometimes, um, especially if I stay in that section throughout the show and I'm, I'm encountering them over and over again. And I'm aware of some people's, you know, this person actually needs a little more help getting to the restroom or this person, you know, is having a little difficulty with their being comfortable in their seat or what have you. Then you're aware of the situation. You can take care of them throughout the show. I mean, it's not so much about being a, a regulator of the rules. Um, it can be that, but that's exactly what Jamson's is trying to, to change about is that it's not about being the uh, security or the enforcer of, of, you know, all those things. You are doing that, but you're also taking care of people. What's the biggest or most common question you get asked from, from customers? Oh, where's the restroom? I mean, where's the restroom? <laughs> no, you get, I mean, you get a whole gamut of things. Um, and, and you always hear the same things over and over again. The same terrible jokes about oxygen masks and nosebleeds in a theater that's clearly not that big. Uh, I think that's definitely one of the misconceptions people have is if they have the seat at the highest end of the theater, they're going to make that joke. You know, people, people want to know how long the show is. They want to know, you know what time they're getting out. They want to know if there's intermission. They want to know, I mean, these are such so, so, so simple questions, but then people will ask you interesting questions. How old's the theater? You know, which I, I do know that, but I wish I knew more about the history of the theater because some people really get excited about that. People want to know about the actors on the stage. You know, um, it, every day can be different and interesting. And then some days can be just routine. It's the same questions. Where's the bathroom? Can I get a playbill? Where's my seat? Why is it so cold in here? You know, all those things, right? Well, what is the, do you hear a complaint uh, more often than not from people about their experience at the theater? Is there a common gripe well, or I think, that they I have? Well, I think that the biggest complaints a patron would have is that the fact that it's so difficult to regulate the temperature of a Broadway theater. I don't think people realize just how difficult that is to do, especially in the summer when we're fighting extreme temperatures. And we also have the stage full of hot lights. And, and the cast, they need a certain temperature. They're going to be sweating all that makeup off and all that glitter and everything. So, um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be frustrated about the temperature. And we just try to comfort them and let them know. We'll let the manager know. The engineer is constantly trying to check the temperature with his little laser gun. Um, and uh, that's one of the big ones. The other thing... The, the, the challenge we have at the Hirschfeld, and I love to let people know the history of why it is the way it is, so maybe they're a little less upset about it, is the fact that the women's restroom is in the basement and the men's room is on the mezzanine level. So if you're in the orchestra, it's not that big of a deal. Everybody has to take a flight of stairs to get to the restroom, but if you're in the mezzanine, the ladies have to go down two flights. The men, their bathroom's right there. And what I try to tell them is, well, look, this theater's 90 years old. We don't have an elevator for that reason. And the fact that when the theater was built, this is, this is a story that was told to me, the theater was built, when the theater was built, it was reversed. The ladies' room was on the mezzanine level. The men's room was in the basement with um, a smoking lounge. But because the percentage of, of, of women coming to the theater grew exponentially, they had to reverse it. And apparently that happened in the 80s. And the fact that, you, you know, the world was different back then. You didn't have people drinking alcohol nonstop during the show and having to use the restroom. So the lines weren't as tremendous. Um, so... That's the big one is it's cold in here. Why is the women's rest restroom two levels down? The men's are right there. So sippy cups are the reason why the lines at the women's restroom <laughs> are so long. They're a blessing and a curse. <laughs> Tim Rice, if those of you who heard the Tim Rice podcast, that was his biggest gripe about the theater what was causing its, uh, its downfall. So take a listen to that. Do you get a lot of international visitors over there? We do. We are at Kinky Boots. I know some shows it, it, it varies, but Kinky Boots definitely does. And that's something you have to assess quickly because, you know, they're not going to understand that you're telling them to go three rows up and to the left. And they're just going to wander off and you have to keep an eye on that. So especially now that we're into that season and that's sort of become the new wave of our, of our guests, 
you got to watch out for that. And, and also the fact that they don't understand all the rules, and if they don't speak English, they're not going to hear the pre-show announcement. They're not going to read the playbill that say, don't take pictures and stuff. So understanding that is so important when you're dealing with. So let's talk about some of those rules. Yes. And you mentioned the idea or the old school idea that an usher should be like a security guard in a way. And I actually, a blog I wrote years ago, uh, which I'll put in the link in this podcast, was when I got so I got so in trouble because I was taking a picture at, of the curtain call mm-hmm. of hair when it was in the park. And an usher practically confiscated my camera, put his hand to my face. And I was so overwhelmed about it. I, I, I blogged about it. Has that changed? How do you, you are given specific uh, rules and things that you need to make sure do not happen, right? Like mm-hmm. what? What can you, what are you on patrol for? I think that's one of the biggest ones. Um, and, and it's the reason why it's important for patrons to always ask questions when they enter the theater, because at our theater, at our show, I should say, because maybe the rule will change when another show comes in way after Kinky Boots closes in 2050. But um, it's yeah, never Kinky closing. Boots, that's Kinky right. Kinky Boots is never going to close. That's right. Uh, Kinky Boots is a show that so smartly is allowing patrons to take photos in the theater before intermission and after, and even of the curtain warmer. And that's so smart, because that's just easy advertising. It's just great for people to be able to create those memories. And it's one less thing for me to say, no, no, don't do that. But during the show, it's a huge issue with, for a couple of reasons. Obviously, copyright is a big issue that that different um, people involved with the production are going to be concerned about. People taking photos and and those photos not being, um, you know, every photo that you can purchase has been, uh, you know, reviewed and it's it's you know it's it's been authorized. Uh, but the other thing is, of course, if it's a flash, that's dangerous for the actors. And so we are asked to patrol those kinds of things. Texting is the big one. Because, you know, you, when I first started ushering, the phone ringing was the big issue. Now I feel like phones don't ring as much, but they're on and people are checking the time, which is a little bit less of, a, of an issue. But when they're on there and they're texting, and they're look, whatever they're doing, you know, and, and we know famously from, from our, our news of late uh, what a distraction it is and that the actors do see these things. So we are asked to take, uh, take it very seriously to patrol for those things. Um, you know, different shows are a little more lenient about the curtain call, but really, no, if actors are on the stage, photographs should not be taken. And I think that, so that, so there's this challenge of people want to do this, they want to take photographs. Other, like I mentioned, other countries, they may be allowed to take photographs there, and those patrons don't understand the pre-show announcement and don't realize that. So if you can be empathetic about those kinds of things, that people are just excited, or that people maybe didn't understand, or maybe they were late and they missed the announcement, or whatever it could possibly be, you know, trying to do it in a kind way as much as possible is the way to go, you know, and that creates a better experience for yourself and the patron because then you're not having this ugly moment. I, that's how I view on view that. But sometimes you got to unfortunately wave that flashlight and get the attention of someone who's in the smack center of a, of a difficult section to get to because it is expected of us. This is something that the show does want us to take care of, not just management. But the show, because it's it's everyone's in everyone's best interest that during the performance these things are not taking place. Texting, photographs, videotaping, all of that stuff. So there's it, this has been in the news a lot lately, mm-hmm. thanks to Ms. Patty, of course, mm-hmm. uh, and the crazy guy that plugged his phone in on the set of the God <laughs> that got yeah. more press than Obama last week, it seems. Um, but. You're on the front lines. You're there. I talk about it all the time. We all talk about it. People comment on the New York Times articles about it. But you're there every night. What would you do to improve theater etiquette? What is there anything we can do with those folks? I I think that the, an idea that keeps coming into my mind um, it would actually solve a couple of, of things. It may be tacky, but and I remember I heard a podcast of yours recently where you discussed the fact that in movie theaters they have these slides before the movie and they are reminding people of safety issues and and etiquette and all those things that's very friendly it's done in a non-aggressive way it might be tacky to have those before a broadway show it might take away from the classiness that people want from broadway but it might also be a, a solution to this if you could put up you know really nice 
rules of that. Well, I don't say rules, but etiquette, you know, and you do it in that way that's friendly and you maybe could do it in different languages, you know, and, and talk to the people in this way, you know, explaining why is always important. Don't do this because of this. And if they know why, then maybe they'll be more likely to want to, you know, for example, I'll, I'll see people texting and they may be in the back row and, and maybe there's no one really near them. And I'll say, I'm so sorry, you can't text in the theater. And, and if they give me this look of like, why? The actors can see it. Oh, and then they respond, right? The why helps them understand. Oh, that's why. And maybe I should respect that rule then. And if we could do that in advance, it might just catch a few more people and, and help. Because I, I, I'm reading a lot of things lately. I think, you know, Jordan Roth talks about this. You've talked about this. This idea, we don't want people to feel like they're not allowed here. That this is like an exclusive club and you're not welcome here and, and, and you should just go home. We want people to feel welcome. So if we can give them a chance to learn, then maybe we could, you know, solve a lot of problems and have more people feel comfortable at the theater. I think the screens before the show could also take care of things like not needing performance inserts. So it might be a more green way to be, you know, this person's playing the role of so-and-so today. Here's their bio or something. And then more people are actually seeing it, maybe, than instead of the insert fall on the ground or whatever. I mean, it, obviously that would lead to advertisements before the show, and maybe that's where it would start to feel kind of, mm, but, you know, it might be another source of income for the show to help with, with running costs. So uh, that's an idea I've had every so often. And I know other ushers feel like it's a waste of paper doing those inserts every day. So I thought, well, maybe we could conquer all these things at once. If we went that route. Well, it's 100% a waste of paper to do those inserts. I've blogged about this before as well. And it's we've got to do something about that. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And frankly, they, they fall out of that pl program all the time anyway. Uh, no one's even reading them, I don't think. Um, I do love this idea of, of yours of educating people on theater etiquette and the why of it, which is mm -hmm. so important. Uh, you know, I have just a few loves in my life. I will say my wife first because uh, I do love you. <laughs> first um, the theater of course and then golf and golf actually is another one that has a, a lot of etiquette that scares people away sometimes and the theater like golf um, has to find a way to be more uh, open and inviting to people rather than scare them away but teaching them the why of all this stuff seems like the way that we could do we could slip with tickets the top 10 theater etiquette and why we can do lots of stuff like that what's the craziest thing that's ever happened in a theater that you've witnessed anything nuts did you have you seen any of the patty uh freak outs or anyone well i was there when she she got angry at the at the photographer at gypsy it, I, mean, I was there as an audience member to be fair um i was i witnessed that one live that was wild um no the thing about the audience they will do things that are okay so the challenge is you know and it makes me furious to see these things you know people who think that a six inch wide rounded velvet ledge overlooking lights and people is a delightful place to put their drink or a smartphone or even a playbill which will fall with a thud that makes me go crazy uh i really go crazy when people do anything with the stage and put their drink on the stage even when they lean on the stage or put their purse and get dressed and ready on this with their stage as their boudoir it drives me crazy right now and the time it takes me to get to them to tell them to please stop it, I do calm down. I do try to be nice about it. Um, uh, but that's the kind of stuff that I, I'm always amazed by the when people forget common. This is going to sound very, very. Um, but you know, they forget common sense. They forget respect. They for, I, I find I, well, I always think that's a true issue we're having right now in our culture is when people do things that are disrespectful, when they're rude, when they're blatantly rude. So part of being empathetic would be to say, hey, maybe they just didn't mean it that way. Maybe they're not trying to be rude. Maybe they're not trying to be inconsiderate. But they do lots of things like that that make you, how do, why do you think that's acceptable? Um, I haven't seen anything crazy like someone climbing onto the stage. But, you know, people will put their feet up on a stage when a performer is right there. Not at our stage. This hasn't happened at Kinky Boots because, thank goodness, the stage is too tall for them. They will put their legs over the pit railing. And that starts to scare the conductor, right by the conductor. If he's trying to, if he's worried about a drink falling on him and someone's legs kicking him, so we have to keep the pit railing clear. I mean, those kinds of things happen. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't seen anything too crazy, like someone climbing onto the stage to charge their phone. I, I don't even know how <laughs> that would go down. Eating? You find people eating? Oh, yeah. 
So what's the what's the biggest thing you've seen people eating? Like oh, you... people love to bring in the smelliest, messiest thing, and we just tell them, please eat that in the lobby. You know, finish that in the lobby, please. Um, I I mean, you know, and I, okay. So you want something dishy for the podcast? I've seen people trying to get it busy in the theater, and I find that amazing. But I guess people feel like it's a, a dareful thing to do. Okay, we're going to take a moment now and get into this <laughs> subject in the orchestra or the mezzanine. The Both. Rivers? Both. Both, and every show has stories about this. Every show, from what I under- understand. Even Siri- Fun Home has people trying to get busy in it. Don't I don't you? know if Fun Home's <laughs> had that yet, but um, yeah, wow. name a show, and it's actually some shows where it's more horrifying to think about than others, but you know, people do try to get away with crazy stuff sometimes. And if you had to interrupt them? Luckily, they stopped before I had to, and I, I was speechless, and I, I, I had to think for a second, okay, what would... What's my training say to do here? Um, I guess get security. I, I don't know. Yeah, that's a that's a tough one to handle. I'm sure <laughs> it's this very fine line, though. And you know, we'll we'll go back to the eating one for uh, you know because we are now allowed to eat at yeah. our seats, right? People can have snacks. That's right. Um, which didn't wasn't always the case, and I've always actually uh, held the opinion that. Look, when I'm munching on popcorn or having a candy bar, I'm a happier person. I got some sugar in me, some salt in me. I may actually enjoy the whole experience, the show, just a little bit more. So as a producer, I've always been okay with that concept. Um, But, of course, everyone seems to be exaggerating this now. Uh, And then there's the question of how much it distracts from the people to the left or right if I'm crunching on popcorn. Mm -hmm. Um, so do you, what, what kind of, do they have candy bars and that kind of stuff there? We do have uh, different snack foods. I think they're doing as great a job as they can on choosing items where the packaging is going to be less noisy if consumed during the show. I know sometimes, and this is particularly a problem when you have a show like The Heiress, which is very quiet, um, and people are crinkling m M&M, uh, wrappers, that's not going to go well. Um, and so I think that they're very aware of those challenges and maybe what to offer and what not to offer on any given show. I mean, that has to be taken into consideration because one of the most famous other things we say before shows is about the whole wrapped candies. So then you can't be giving wrapped candies because that's just going to escalate that, that issue. Um, I, fortunately, it hasn't been... I haven't noticed it as being too much of a problem at Kinky Boots. Either the patrons are being really good about how they're operating the packaging during the show, or the show has been loud enough. Or I, I'm not. I have been on shows though where where it is an issue, and I'm being asked by a patron, "Please go tell them to stop." And all I can do is say, "I'm so sorry. Can you please wrap that quiet, more quietly? Can you open it?" The thing is, people should know this is a tip. If you have to unwrap something, do it fast. Don't do it slow and take five minutes. Of crinkle, 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 just crinkle, and it's over with. That's that's one thing. Yeah, or just cover it with a cough, or wait till a big laugh. <laughs> I wait till a big laugh in the show. Usually, that's what I do. Uh, what do you think about pre-show announcements? Does every show that you've worked on have a pre-show announcement now? Is everybody doing them? Um, I think a lot of shows still do the um, just an audio of someone. I think Kiki Boots has a really brilliant one um, with with having an actor more or less in character, give the, the information and, and make it funny. I think the audience has responded to that greatly. Um, I think, you know, that's that's a smart way to do it, you know? If you're not going to put the screens up before the show, and you know an audio announcement's just sort of maybe will be tuned out, this is a way to really get people's attention and get the information out. You've been in New York now 12 years, and uh, you're an actor as well, mm-hmm. yes? Uh, and you're a theater lover. You see lots of shows, I Absolutely, assume, yes? Yeah. How do you think Broadway is doing over the past dozen years? You've been here a while now. Yeah. You, are you happy with the state of Broadway? I, I think so overall. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of really cool things. Certainly this past year with things like Fun Home and Carrie Vincent, of course, being two very, very cool pieces of theater and actually winning the prize. You know, that's exciting. And I've loved a lot of the shows that have been around lately. Like, I love Kinky Boots. I love Once. I love... Book of Mormon, um, Gentleman's Guide. These are all great shows, and so it's it's neat seeing all the uh, and, and things that are so innovative. Um, I guess uh, one thing that would be neat to see um, would be more spaces like the Circle in the Square. You know, uh, uh, Fun Home reminded me of this: how much I love theater in the round, even especially musicals in the round. 
And the fact that shows like Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812, Here Lies Love, shows like that that are outside the box staging would have a home on Broadway. I think more of that would be really exciting. Um, do people ask you for your recommendations when they're... They do. Yeah. 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 And I try to I try to think about what, what this person probably will like. If I... If I if I say a show that might be risky, I, I, I sort of, you know, qualify it that way. So if, if I'm going to recommend Hedwig and the Angry Inch, I'm going to say it's very adult. It's probably a little more risky. It's not kinky boots, but it's, you know. Uh, but I, I'll recommend shows that I feel I've heard. If I haven't seen the show, I know it's good, but I've heard a lot of really good buzz. And particularly in juxtaposition, like, well, does this seem like a, a regular theater-going patron? Or is this someone who's like an avid theater-goer? What are they going to appreciate? And, you know, some shows are easier to recommend than others. So I try to come up with like five that I think they'll like. There's a great tip there for those of you looking to spread word of mouth about your shows. Invite the ushers of all <laughs> the theaters. Right. Invite everyone who's talking to consumers like um, like John is every night. Okay. My last question, mm -hmm. which I know you've listened to the podcast before, mm -hmm. so you may know what's coming, but here it is, the genie question. Imagine that genie comes to you from Aladdin and says you've been a very good usher and dedicated service to the Broadway community uh, and to the Broadway audience over the last dozen years. I want to reward you with a wish, one wish that you can change whatever drives you nuts about Broadway, whatever keeps you up at night and gets you so angry, angry just like people putting their feet on the stage of a Broadway theater, that sacred place. What's the one thing you'd ask that genie to change? The only thing that keeps me up at night about Broadway is the fact that I'm not on it yet. But that's not my answer because that's not what I'm here for. Uh, you know, the one thing I, I think would be really, really cool and innovative and would solve a lot of problems that we've already discussed today, um, I think they should make the bathrooms gender neutral. I think they should maybe, when it's needed, the Hirschfeld is a perfect theater for that. Because if you did that, you wouldn't have to tell ladies to go downstairs two levels. There's no way to put an elevator in, right? There's just no way with, with landmark status and everything. You would also wouldn't have to worry about the percentages of men and women that night. Let's say you run a show where it's going to be even, right? And you've got this large women's bathroom and this okay men's bathroom. It'll probably be okay. Let's say you pull on a show that's mostly going to attract men. And now you've got this women's restroom that's not even being used. You know, not by that many people, and this men's line that's out of this world. Book of Mormon actually has had men's lines that have made me want to cry, um, uh, which is great, but that men are coming to the theater. Um, let's say you have a show that's just like, there are no guys going, 98%. We've had nights at Kinky Boots that felt like that, and the women are like, why can't we use the men's restroom? Why can't we use the men's restroom? Please, this line is scary. Why can't we use the men's restroom? And I feel weird saying at Kinky Boots of all shows, it's against the law when we're trying to say that, you know, we're trying to uh, support the idea of gender equality and, and expression and everything. I think it would solve a lot of, 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 of modern problems if we move in that direction as a society. I think that there are a lot of people who identify as transgender who probably would feel more comfortable not having to make that choice. And to be honest, at Kinky Boots, we get a lot of people who dress up in drag and come to the theater, and I don't think they know, all of them, which restroom they should be asking for. It'd be really neat not to have to make them choose. So that's my idea. Unisex bathrooms on Broadway. That's the kind of ideas we bring you on the podcast <laughs> here. I love it. Uh, John, I want to thank you so much for being a guest here on the podcast and also for serving on the front lines of Broadway. You and all the ushers out there and the box office personnel who I think we're going to have someone uh, from a box office on a podcast soon. Um, the state doormen are the, some of the most important people we have in the business because you literally touch the consumer every single night at work. Uh, you are our ambassador, so thank you so much for that. Thanks to all of you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe. Next week's guest is a guy responsible for almost all of the cast recordings you own. Tune in next week to find out who it is. Thanks for listening. Hey guys, don't forget, Spring Awakening returns to Broadway in just a few short weeks in a production unlike anything you could ever imagine. You're going to love it, I promise. Get tickets today, Ticketmaster.com. See you next week. I'm gonna be a producer.